Hello everyone, welcome to Heritage Hour with Gateshead Archive. Tonight we're going fully live with a good friend of the archive, author, local historian, tour guide and former colleague Anthea Lan, who is going to tell us all about notable women of Gateshead. Um, Anthea will be taking your questions afterwards, so do send them at any point during the talk uh, and we can gather them together uh, for the Q&A at the end. So just use the little comments button um, below the video that you're watching. Um, Anthea, thank you for being here. I'll hand over our lovely audience to you now. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Well, it's nice to be back with, um, with you all tonight. And I'm going to share some stories about some of Gateshead's notable women. And I'm sure you'll have heard of, um, of most of them. But there might be a couple that you aren't so um, well aware of. Some have blue plaques and some don't. Some have made a big difference to Gateshead. Others have made more of a national impact and some haven't made an impact at all. But you'll understand, hopefully, um, when I start to tell you about them. So I've taken a selection um, of notable women, and I've put them in chronological order. So I'm going to start with the botanist, Mary Eleanor Bowes of Gibside. Now, Mary Eleanor Bowes gets a bad press because, of course, uh, she had uh, a disastrous second marriage. But we should celebrate her for, for her achievements in botany. And here's Mary Eleanor. Um, she wasn't the prettiest girl in the 18th century. She was described as short, dumpy, well bosomed with a wobbly chin. So she didn't have a lot going for her, but she did have lots of money. Um, her first husband is the gentleman in red, John, the ninth Earl of Strathmore, and he died in 1776. And after that, she was tricked into marriage with the gentleman at the bottom right, Andrew Robinson Stoney. And in effect, he put a stop to Mary Eleanor's botanical ambitions. But her interest in botany started when she was a little girl. She had her own garden at Gibside. Um, we know this because there's accounts of um, bulbs being procured for Miss Bow's garden. So she had her own little garden. And when she married her first husband, the ninth Earl of Strathmore, they had this constructed at Gibbside, um, which was referred to as Mary Eleanor's, or the Countess of Strathmore, I should say, the Countess of Strathmore's greenhouse. Now those lovely arches, they were filled with orange trees. So then it got the name, the Orangery. And it was altered by Mary Eleanor's grandson, John Bowles, in the mid 19th century. And uh, then it became known as the Conservatory, but I like to call it uh, the Countess of Strathmore's greenhouse. And it was here that she really developed um, her interest. And she and her husband had a house in, in London, Stanley House. And I put a quote here that was written about her, um, that she began to build hot houses and conservatories and she brought exotic plants from the cave. Um, and the gentleman shown here is William Patterson, who was just a young explorer, but she employed him to go out to the cave and bring back um, some new specimens that she could plant in her, in her greenhouse. And of course, she was very often away from Gibside, but every day she would write letters to the gardeners at Gibside telling them what had to be done. And you can just imagine, you know, um, every day, oh, what does Madam want us to do today? You know, um, it, <laughs> they must have been fed up sometimes, but she absolutely knew what she was doing. Anyway, unfortunately, when Andrew came along, um, he basically, uh, imprisoned her, he ill-treated her and um, stopped um, any plans for plant collecting 
Uh, in fact, um, William Patterson didn't get paid and he was very nearly stranded out in the uh, out in the Cape. But if you want evidence of Mary Eleanor's um, interest in botany, this is her plant cabinet. And you can see this at the Bose Museum uh, near Barnet Castle. And in here she would keep um, specimens of her plants, all labelled, of course, and seeds and bulbs. And in the centre is a double trumpeted daffodil, and she had her own daffodil, which um, was very similar to this in that it was a double, uh, a double trumpet. So she was regarded as the foremost female botanist of her age, and I think that's how we should remember Mary Eleanor, not because of her disastrous love affairs and uh, all the liaisons and everything that she got up to, but what she did for plants and flowers. And then we come to the suffragist. I could have called this the educationalist as well, Emily Davies. Um, suffragist, of course, someone who uh, advocates getting the vote for women in a peaceable manner. And Emily was born um, in um, Southampton, but she spent much of her childhood in Gateshead, uh, in this building at the top right, which of course was the rectory on Benjamin Road. And she had a, you know, a, a, a very middle class upbringing, but quite protected, I think. And, uh, you know, her father was rector of Gateshead, John Davies, and kept her sort of close to home. But there, there are stories that Emily used to sneak out of the rectory. Um, she would take bread and jam from the kitchens. And she would go down to the slums on the quayside and give it to people. And later on in life, she wrote, you know, working class women are undernourished, constantly sick, worn out by childbearing, ill treatment and work that is far too heavy. Those who have come into immediate contact as I have with the female workers in glass houses, paper mills, brickyards will confess that this is no exaggerated statement. Now, one thing that really annoyed Emily was the fact that her brother got a good education, but as a girl, she didn't. It wasn't thought necessary that um, young ladies um, should be educated. But after her father died, she moved to London and she met a lot of influential women, um, women such as Millicent Fawcett, uh, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, um, Barbara Bordichon, who were all interested in votes for women and also for education. And um, Emily said, if neither governesses or mothers know, how can they teach? So long as education is not provided for them, how can it be provided by them? So she was very keen for girls to get um, an education. And she became active on the, um, the, London, um, the London School Board. And then she started to advocate the admission of women into universities. And of course, all the universities at this time were exclusively for men. And she co-founded, um, with the support of um, a few other influential ladies, Girton College. And this was originally established in Hertfordshire, um, but then later moved in 1873 to the outskirts of Cambridge. And this is, this is Girton. And what Emily wanted was this very similar sort of curriculum um, as that that was offered to, to men. But of course, and there's an example of this later in the talk, women could go to Cambridge and they could do the same course as men, the same degree course, but they weren't actually awarded degrees until 1948. It's totally ironic that you could go to university and not actually get the degree that you're qualified for. She became very active in votes for women, but she didn't want votes for all women. Um, she felt very strongly that if a, a married woman didn't need the vote, because of course your only duty was to vote the way that your husband did. So she um, advocated the vote for um, single women. 
um, for women on their on their own. But I, I rather like this quote. We've persuaded ourselves that Englishmen of the present day are such a nervously excitable race that the only chance for their descendants is to keep the mothers in a state of coma. The fathers, we think, are incurable. And she began um, advocating uh, votes for women uh, in the 1860s. And she was one of very, very few who lived until uh, she could see that votes for women over 30 were awarded uh, in 1918. And in this photograph, Emily's on the right with the, um, the cane, and the lady um, second, from the, uh, second from the left with the mortarboard is Millicent Garrett Fawcett, who of course was the leader of the suffragist um, movement. And Emily has a blue plaque, and you can find that uh, on the walls of uh, on Bencham, uh, Bencham Road, uh, the walls outside the, the where the rectory was. It's now uh, Bencham Court, um, but you can find that plaque there. So Emily has a blue plaque. Now the philanthropist, I think I could call Elizabeth Spence Watson. Uh, who lived at Bencham Grove with her husband, Robert. Robert has a blue plaque, but Elizabeth doesn't. Um, but nevertheless, she was, a, she was a real social reformer and she played a key role in Tyneside politics and education in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, she was born Elizabeth Richardson in 1838 and she was the daughter of a leather manufacturer um, Edward Richardson and her mother was Jane Wiggum and her brother John Wiggum Richardson later founded the uh, shipbuilding company and here are a few photos of Elizabeth. Um, the one on the left is uh, a, a young woman just more or less at the time um, of her marriage and then you've got Robert and Elizabeth in the centre. Elizabeth is an older lady uh, on the right hand side and Bencham Grove and of course um, Elizabeth came from a very strong um, Quaker family. Um, she spent her first few years in uh, Summerhill Grove in Newcastle. Um, the family then moved to Elswick, but she married Robert Spence Watson in 1863. And Robert was a key figure in liberal politi politics. And there's no doubt about it that um, Elizabeth was, um, was his supporter and and, and help meet. And um, Robert, of course, established the Durham School of Science. Uh, he was very active in the, um, the Lytton Phil. But Elizabeth led the Newcastle Women's Liberal Association. Um, she supported a range of radical uh, causes. Uh, she was very sympathetic to Irish home rule, um, as was Robert. And, in 1888, the couple went to Ireland and they addressed a meeting and she was the only lady on the platform which overlooked a vast audience of over 7,000 people. And of course, um, Robert was very keen to encourage links with political refugees from Europe and uh, co-founded the Society of Friends of Russian Freedom. And here's two more photos of Elizabeth and one of them obviously you can see with her family with Robert, um, son uh, Arnold and the five, um, the five daughters. Um, her elder sister, uh, Anna Deborah Richardson was also a promoter of women's education. And um, the girls all went to the college. They were all encouraged um, to take an active part in, in education. Um, but you have to have some sympathy for Elizabeth because Robert was a, definitely, I think, um, a free spirit and, you know, would, would invite people to Bencham Grove for breakfast. You know, come and have breakfast in the morning with us. And that was fine, but Elizabeth would find out, you know, late at night, the previous evening. Oh, dear, I've invited 10, you know, 10 uh, unemployed men for breakfast in the morning. And, you know, what are we going to do? And... Uh, people would land, you know, to stay with them. And there, were, there wasn't any room for the ladies to make this kind of thing. But they were a really interesting family. And Elizabeth comes across uh, as, a, as a lovely lady. In the First World War, she, she supported 
a lot of the men who were conscientious objectors um, in their in their fights not not to fight, and the family um, went mountaineering. Um, this is their mountaineering garb. Um, this uh, photograph is taken on one of their on one of their trips, and the girls are wearing sort of breeches. But Elizabeth's in the in the full skirt there, and there's and there's Robert, and they just plough up these mountains. And then this is a letter that um, Elizabeth wrote to Robert, um, describing a women's peace rally in London uh, in 1900. So um, a really important and very nice lady, I think. So now we move on to the unknown really in this talk. And I've called her the artist's model, but in a sense, that sounds like she did that for a living. Well, she didn't. But she was really important as someone who was painted by the main pre-Raphaelite painters of the day. Maria was the daughter of a um, soap manufacturer, uh, Thomas Headley, and um, she married James Leithart, a lead manufacturer, in 1858. He was 20 years older than she was. Um, and he was a real collector and a patron of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, who were doing the really fashionable paintings at the time. And he um, was very friendly with William Bell Scott, William Bell Scott, who painted the mural, murals at, um, at Wallington. And William Bell Scott acted as James Lee Hart's sort of painting scout, if you like. And he um, arranged for Rossetti to come to Bell Scott's studio in Newcastle and paint Maria in 1862. Uh, now, obviously, what would happen at the studio was that there would be a rough painting done. And then it's fairly obvious that they, um, the dress that she wore was kept by uh, Rossetti until the painting was finished because um, there's a letter that um, was sent by Rossetti to Leithart. Um, Today the portrait has been fetched by Green and I trust starts this afternoon for Newcastle. The dress, book and two drawings are enclosed. Rossetti wasn't terribly happy with this painting and neither was James Leithart. James Leithart complained that it made Maria look too old. And apparently Rossetti is um, supposed to um, have retorted that it didn't matter because she would grow into it. And the family lived at Bracken Dean at Low Fell. Um, another visitor um, was Arthur Hughes, and another pre-Raphaelite painter, who painted Miss, Mrs. Leithart and her first three children in 1863. Um, it looks like they're on the continent because this is a sort of Venetian balcony, um, but I'm pretty sure that they weren't anywhere near the continent. Um, when this was um, when this was done, um, Maria went on to have ten more children uh, after these three. And then we have this painting, which is really interesting, by Ford Maddox Brown, who did these huge panoramic paintings, and he called this one work, and he painted it in eighteen in eighteen sixty three. And James Leithart um, saw this and thought he liked it, but he wanted to commission another copy, a smaller version of it. But there's a subtle difference. This is the original, and I've enlarged the section on the left with the lady in the umbrella, the parasol, I should say, uh, and the little, this little sort of, uh, the, the, the hat with the blue bow. And this was Ford Maddox Brown's wife, but James Leithart didn't want her in the painting. So he commissioned a copy, but here we have Maria instead of um, Mrs. Brown. Just shows what you can do um, if you have enough money. The interesting thing is that um, in 1866, Leithart lent this painting to the Mechanics Institute in Newcastle, and it was unfavorably described as one of the most extraordinary mistakes of the present day. 
The sad thing about the Leithards is that they got into many difficulties. James ended up um, having to sell a number of paintings and then on his death, the collection was, what was left was, was split to pay for death duties. But the Rossetti painting is still in the hands of the family. And if you want a reminder of the Leithards, if you go into St. Helen's Church in Low Fell, you can find this lovely um, memorial window the pre-Raphaelite memorial window. So now we come to the playwright, Catherine Githa Sowerby, who was a member of the Sowerby Glass uh, family and lived at Ravenshill off the um, Durham Road. And here we have um, Catherine a, a painting a portrait. And then we have the cover of what made her famous, um, a play called Rutherford and Son. Um, Rutherford and Son was based on her own uh, family. And it was a fairly gritty, no punches pulled family saga set against the backdrop of a glass works. And she wrote it when her family moved, um, moved south. And her grandfather was thought to be the inspiration for the brutal patriarch in Rutherford and Son. And it was through listening to um, her father's business conversations at Low Fell that she learned about the, um, the sort of harsh reality of, of business. Um, she moved to London and she joined the Fabian Society. And although she wasn't a suffragette, she did believe strongly um, in equality for, for women. Rutherford and Son was not published under her name. Uh, it was published um, as G.K. Sowerby, which gave people the impression that it was a man because she felt that um, if people thought a woman had written it, it wouldn't be so popular. Anyway, it was a real hit. It was put on in 1912. It ran for 133 performances in London. Then it went to New York and it played for 63 performances um, in New York. And a critic there declared it among the most powerful works of the younger generation. It was also produced in Canada, Australia, and in languages, including German, French, Italian, Russian, and Bohemian. The money that she got enabled her to um, pay for what might be regarded as vanity publishing, uh, <clears throat> poems that she'd written that were illustrated by her sister Millicent. This was a way of um, getting Millicent's name to the fore and getting Millicent some money. Um, and that's, she never did another, um, another published play. She, she wrote seven more, but they were never, um, they were never published. Um, sadly, by the end of her life, she became convinced that people had lost interest. Uh, in her work, and she destroyed all her photographs and personal correspondence. But she does have a blue plaque, and you can find it on um, Durham Road. So now we come to the engineer, Rachel Mary Parsons. Now, most people have heard of Charles Parsons, and of course he was the um, designer and inventor of the turbinia which you can see at the um, Discovery Museum. But Rachel isn't so well known, but she should be because she was an amazing female engineer. And the family lived um, at Wrighton. And um, Catherine, uh, Rachel and Tommy, her brother, were always um, fascinated by her father's experiments. And he used to make these mad, um, mad toys for a um, he, um, helicopters and a toy that was called the spider that was powered by methylated spirits. And she got used to taking things apart and putting them back together again. Um, they did lots of experimenting. They went to America with their father on, um, uh, on the Mauritania. Uh, she travelled on the Turbinia, even though she felt um, a bit um, a bit seasick <laughs> and um, got a bit wet, I think. Um, she went to Rodine School 
And then she was enrolled at Newnham College, Cambridge, which was also a college that was partially set up by Emily Davis that I talked about earlier. And she became the first woman to read mechanical science. And Tommy Parsons followed his father into the company, but of course he was uh, called up in the First World War. And Rachel stepped into the, um, the breach uh, as a director at the Heaton Works. And she helped to train some of the women who entered the munitions factory. And of course, they learned to do everything from assembling aircraft to making telescopes, periscopes, searchlights, shells. But sadly, uh, Tommy died um, before the war ended. And I think Rachel thought that she would be, you know, kept on as a director at the works. But Charles decided not to do this. And he couldn't reconcile the fact of a woman being a director of an engineering company, even though um, she was a founder of the, the magazine, The Woman Engineer, along with her mother, incidentally. Um, so there was a big rift in the family and um, she just had to leave the, um, she had to leave the, the works. She founded the Women's Engineering Society and um, she went into politics. She stood as a, um, a for London County Council. Um, she stood for Parliament in 1923, although she didn't get um, elected. And once her parents died, she inherited a large fortune. But she was an unhappy woman. You know, she, she had all these ambitions. She was very clever. She couldn't succeed in science because doors were barred to her. She failed in politics. And so for the rest of her days, she lived life as a rich uh, socialite. She was a society hostess. She went to Royal Ascot. She would winter in Bermuda and Palm Beach. And she came to a very sad end. Um, towards the end of her life, she got very interested in um, racehorses and she bought um, an estate in Newmarket in Suffolk. And um, she um, bred racehorses. She had a stud farm. She was very worried about um, intruders. She'd had a few burglaries and she set up a homegrown alarm system, which consisted of a massive trip wires connected to 12 ball cartridges, um, which was stuck to the doorposts of each room. Can you imagine? But all this didn't stop um, her being murdered. And it was a, um, they did catch the man who did it, but it was such a sad end to such an important, uh, an important woman. And now we come to the sisterhood, three sisters. Hope, Ruth and Sylvia Dodds of Home House in Low Fell. And here are the girls. Their father was Edwin Dodds. He was a bookbinder on Newcastle Quayside. Their mother was Emily Bryan Dodds. Uh, she died quite young. And they had another sister and another brother. But this, these three sisters never married. Um, there are connections with other people in the talk because um, Hope went to Girton College. She studied at um, she studied at uh, at Girton, um, but of course didn't uh, didn't get a degree. Um, Sylvia um, concentrated very much on home things and something else that I'll come to in a minute. And Ruth went into um, politics. This is Hope getting uh, the Clarence Walton Award uh, in Gateshead Library in about the mid 50s. And this was the seminal book that she wrote. She co-wrote it with um, Ruth actually, um, The Pilgrimage of Grace. And this remained as a standard textbook um, for 50 years uh, after, being, uh, after she wrote it. So she was really important from a historical uh, point of view. She also wrote an unpublished history of Law Fell, but sadly, by the time she wrote it, 
Um, she wrote a lot of it from memory and unfortunately um, some of the memories were a little, um, let's say, not quite accurate. And this is Ruth at the opening of um, Sunderland Road Library in Gateshead. She became a, an independent Labour councillor. Um, Ruth also has a local heroes plaque uh, on the quayside, so she has two. She has two plaques, if you like. Um, she stood as well. She was nearly selected as a candidate to be Gateshead's MP, but. The fact that she was a woman, that just didn't go down too well. And um, when the Second World War broke out, um, the family were uh, Quakers and she decided that she couldn't support, she, they were pacifists and she couldn't support the idea of war. And so resigned from the Independent Labour Party and resigned from politics. And like Rachel really, I think had a lot more to give um, I think she suffered from uh, the time that she was uh, that she was born. However, um, she did have a real effect on on local literature and with drama. And um, the Indep the Independent Labour Party often had theatrical groups, and the Progressive Players were formed um, out of this, um, founded by Ruth in 1920. And she wrote a number of plays herself to be performed, including this one, uh, The Pitman's Pay, which was based on a poem by uh, Thomas Wilson. Um, all the sisters were involved in dramatics, um, in stage managing, in costume. Sylvia really was the, the, the wardrobe mistress for many years and um, was always very keen to make sure that um, none of the ladies wore revealing costumes. They always had to have a little handkerchief tucked into their bosom so that they wouldn't display any cleavage. All very, all very tasteful. Um, both Ruth, well, all three girls, I think, worked in munitions works in the First World War, um, in Armstrong's rather than Parsons. And of course, they came into contact. They were middle class girls, these three. And they came into contact with um, working women. And I think this is an interesting thing about munition, people who worked in the munitions works, because the social classes mixed. Very often, the upper class women had to take instruction from working class girls. And this would have been unheard of um, before, um, before the war. And in, 18, in 1943, the Little Theatre opened, um, the three sisters who I think had come into money after their aunts, the Miss Mawsons had died. And they um, bought the site for the Little Theatre and um, paid for the, um, for the erecting of it. And of course, the Little Theatre has gone um, from strength to strength ever since. Now we come to the little sister to the poor, Sister Winifred Lever, who many people have very fond um, memories of in, in Gateshead. And as a young woman, she, um, she wanted to be a nurse, um, she wanted to be a missionary, but she had um, ill health and she was told that that wasn't possible. So then she decided that she would come to Gateshead. And her doctor said that she wouldn't last a year if she did because Gateshead was regarded as the TB capital um, of, this, of this country, but that didn't deter Winifred. Um, still a young woman, she um, came to Gateshead, she founded the Vine Street Mission in 1915, and then she found the dreadful poverty that many people were um, experiencing. And she worked tirelessly supplying food for those too poor to afford it. Um, there's always an example given where, um, you know, she was a nurse. She did do medical care uh, as well. And um, she treated a young boy and put a bread poultice uh, on him. And then she watched as he walked away and took the bread poultice off 
um, and he was taking it home to eat. So it just shows you what poverty was, was like. But she thought nothing of taking hundreds of children to the seaside for day trips. And they all had a little rubber stamp on their wrist so that if they got lost, people knew, you know, that they were with um, Sister Winifred. She provided Christmas parties for them. And she's often heralded as, as one of Gateshead's unsung um, heroes. Um, and I think everybody who knew her, um, you know, loved, loved her. Um, she, um, she started a surgery for people who couldn't afford the doctor. Um, she used to give breakfasts to, to people before church. And at one stage, she had the biggest girl guide group in the country. And she also had a large following of Boy Scouts. And Christmas parties, she would organise for at least 1,200 people. So she's amazing. She was up every morning at five o'clock um, to pray. And she also, like Ruth Jones, has a local hero plaque. And she also has um, a blue plaque. And as you can see, she was awarded the British Empire Medal. And like Ruth was made an honorary freeman of the borough, Ruth Dodds um, was that as well. And then our last notable woman is Constant Leithart, who was the granddaughter of James and Maria Leithart, who I talked about before. And there's no doubt about it, but Connie, um, as she was known, um, was a real um, character, but again, someone who suffered um, not necessarily because of a block on her ambitions, but this time because of her appearance. Uh, obviously, the family were well to do. Um, Constance got very interested um, in aviation. She started flying lessons at Newcastle Aero Club. Um, and she wrote her name on the application as C.R. Leithart, disguising the fact that she was a a woman, um, much as Githa Sowerby had done um, 12 years earlier. And uh, it didn't all go according to plan. Um, she um, had a first solo flight in 1926 um, in, in this, Tiger Moth, and she crashed it, which um, wasn't, very, wasn't very good, but it didn't put her off. Um, she was um, she was very um, very resilient, and um, she was back in the air again for a thirty minute flight. And in 1927, um, she got her flying license, and she became the first British female pilot outside London to achieve this. And at the time, there were only twenty female pilots in the UK. She became part of a group of um, flying socialites and she participated successfully in many air races. But of course, when war broke out, um, a lot of women were recruited for the new um, Women's Auxiliary uh, Air Force. And she'd been, um, she volunteered to, um, to join. Um, she'd been working in the map department at Bristol Airport. And what these women were originally meant to do was just to transport planes um, from one base to another. But they did end up flying much further than that. And of course, all girls wanted to be glamorous, but poor Connie wasn't glamorous. She's on the um, left hand side of this. Um, photograph as we look at it and she laughed at herself she used to say you know she was just a square body she wasn't particularly tall and she was often just not included in these in these group um, photographs but she flew all sorts of um, planes and this is her little notebook where she kept a note of um all of different planes that she flew. And you can see she flew hurricanes, Les Sanders, um, Spitfires, Tiger Moths, uh, all sorts, uh, absolutely um, amazing. Unfortunately, she didn't get to the end of the 
um, the war, um, she was um, ill for a little while. And then when she got back, they wanted to demote her for, for no reason. And she refused that. So um, the war didn't really end happily for Connie, but there's no doubt that she made a huge um, contribution. And um, here you see she, she's quite um, humorous about herself. Um, how does it fit in or get off? Um, this is a you know acknowledgement of her size. I mean, she doesn't look enormous, does she? Um, but this is this is what she thought of herself. And then um, there she is getting a bouquet of flowers, and she's captioned it: "Here comes, here comes the bride." Um, after the war, she became a United Nations special representative to um, the Greek island of Icaria, and you can see here she got the order de merit. Um, from um, Save the Children Fund. And uh, her great friend and co-founder co of Pramlington Aerodrome was um, Walter Runciman. And um, here he is with, with Connie very much in um, retirement. Um, she had a small holding and she kept um, a couple of donkeys, you can see those. Uh, you can see those there. But she's definitely an unsung, he unsung hero, um, I think, Constance. And um, with that, that brings us to um, the end of this um, live talk. And um, I'm very happy to, um, to take questions. Thank you, Anthea. Uh, I learned so much in that talk. No, normally, if you our talks are pre-recorded and we have a live Q&A, um, but this is all live, so I had not seen that. You've been scribbling non-stop throughout because, wow, you, you really get a sense of, of how much women's contributions and achievements have just been completely overlooked. <laughs> what, what did we have there? The first women to read mechanical science. We had yeah. the first women... British female pilot outside of London. You've got a published playwright. Lots of comments going on throughout, Anthea. Um, Lynn saying that she saw, lots of comments about Rutherford and Son, actually. Lynn saying she saw Rutherford and Son um, at the West Yorkshire Playhouse a few years ago, and it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Good. It's an asking, um, do we know if Rutherford and Son had been produced on stage in Tyneside since. I think actually Maureen Duffy has answered that for us. She yes. Said, revived by Northern Stage about 10 to 12 years ago. Yeah. That was at the time when um, Gifa got a blue plaque. That was doing ah, okay. at the same okay. at the same time. So lots of interest kind of in yeah. that area. Yeah. And lots of interest in Rachel Parsons as well. Oh, she's she's really interesting, Rachel. Really, um, I think she could have done so much more than than she did. She was just completely thwarted by um, circumstances and her and her family. And you know, the women the women weren't perceived as you know being scientists. This was a real you know breakthrough. And engineers. Yeah, and I loved that um, women engineer. I've not seen that women engineer. <laughs> magazine cover that's un that's amazing I know. we need to have that on the wall of the archive i think <laughs> that was her on the front was it no no it wasn't that, her no, on that the was cover. just that the, was, yeah that, that was, was an american female engineer yeah i but, love it though yeah fantastic um let's have a look so i'm going to ask you a difficult question <laughs> okay favorite do you have a favorite Oh, I think the favourite's got to be Constance Leithart. I just think yes. she is yeah. amazing. Um, and again, somebody who who could have done who could have done more. I think she was her own worst enemy because I think she thought of herself as sort of small and 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 dumpy and um. very good when she got off the ground, you know, in a in a plane. And she was a you know, she was a madcap. She she did all sorts of things in in planes, and she had lots of crashes. <laughs> I'm yes. not sure I'd want to go up in a plane with Constance, but she did have a few 
um, near misses. But at the same time, when you see the variety of planes that she flew, I mean, absolutely incredible. She was a lucky lady crashing a tiger moth on her foot. <laughs> she was. I'm surprised they let her back in. <laughs> Wow, we've got lots of people saying thank you. Thank you so much. An absolutely fantastic talk Brilliant to hear about the achievements coming from Kate said. Um, who do you think, so out of all those women, so varied what they did, who do you think made the, the greatest contribution? Oh, that's that's a really difficult one. I think if you um because they all did in different ways, but not all necessarily to Gates said. If if you sort of look at the effect, uh, you know, what did they actually have on, on Gates said, then, I mean, the Dodd sisters have got the legacy of the theatre, mm. which obviously, you know, is is important. The people that, the, the person that, you know, if you talk about notable women, the one person that people go, oh, I remember her, is Winifred Lever. You know, who, who definitely did make a huge difference to people, you know, living in the um, sort of teens area and Bencham area of, of, of Gateshead. Um, so I think, you know, I think she, she she's, she's important. But when you look at things um, wider, then obviously Rachel Parsons um, is important. Elizabeth Spence Watson, too, was very important to the local um community um mm. i think if she hadn't been married to robert i mean obviously she got the opportunity to do what she did because she was married to robert but yes. in some ways it was overshadowed by by robert because she did the things that robert wanted to do and you know and 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 did um and you wonder you know what what she would have done had she not had had she not had um Robert, I'm sure she would have done, you know, done things, but we just don't know what. Just gone on to do great things. I guess a lot yeah. of class women kind of just became the supporters of the husband once they were, they were already maybe kind of, yeah. you know, politicised, but then yeah. that, that became their role to support. I mean, they did have a very equal marriage. You mm. know, I wouldn't want you to get the sense that, you know, Robert ruled the, ruled the roost. Mm. It was a true partnership. You know, but there's no doubt that she got involved in things with Robert that she wouldn't have got involved with ordinarily. Yeah, undoubtedly at that time. Maureen's got another very interesting comment, which is um, regarding Sylvia Dodds being wardrobe mistress mm -hmm. at the theatre. She just said, we might like to know that the, the little theatre, the progressive players still have many of the costumes made by her and her helpers. Yeah. yeah. And I have visited that costume department, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? I wonder. <laughs> it is unbelievable. Absolutely beautiful. It's, a, it's an archive in itself. It's it is. It is. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trolling through the comments. Sorry, we have an, uh, a record number of people watching tonight. Just lots oh, of... Oh, good. Oh, Bob's, sis Bob's sister's mother-in-law was housekeeper to the Dodd sisters. Oh, right. Someone asking, this is quite specific, Andy, so no, I don't know, what year Rachel Parsons was at Cambridge? I just mean generally what? Oh, um, probably about 19, 1985, probably about 1905, something like that. Yeah, so quite early. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I think, well, yeah, so most of the rest just people just saying what a, a really important book. Thank you very much, Anthea. My pleasure. Brilliant. Oh, and we've got one from Lee saying good examples of pre Raphaelite windows. Um, this is obviously linked to the Lee Arts. Yeah. Can be found in the Crown Posada pub. Oh, yes. <laughs> Once we can get back in there. <laughs> That's on the other side of the river. <laughs> on the other side. We're allowed to go over there sometime. <laughs> A huge thank you, Anthea, as always, learned a huge amount. I'm sure everyone did who was listening and watching. Um, do join us next week, everyone, when Val Scully, a bit of a change of plan. Um, we've got Val Scully, who will be telling us all about the history of the area known locally as the land of oak and iron. 
So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Anthea. Stay safe and we shall see you all next week, hopefully. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>